Yes, we are live. Hi, everyone. I am Vyashini Roy, and I welcome you all to the stories of forced migration and the team wise reviews March 2022 project in association with Global South Colloquium, University of Victoria. We are seeking submissions in the form of essay, stories, and poems. The registrations for our advanced writing workshop are also open. To know more about the architecture of our presently ongoing projects, please visit our website, www.tellmeastory.biz. The topic of our digital conversation today is profits and poverty, understanding the economics of labor trafficking. And trafficking, as we all know, is an organized, targeted crime that drives human beings into exploitative conditions with the major aim to make profits. And trafficking, despite rigorous implementations and increase um, in the number of public welfare organizations, continues to remain a large-scale lucrative industry. Martin Luther King once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And today, we will be addressing an extremely important issue. We are honored to have amongst us Dr. Susan Neibon, Dr. Julia O'Connell Davidson, Dr. Jill Hanley, who through the years of rigorous involvement in this field are experts in the field of discussion. Unfortunately, Mr. William would not be able to join the discussion today, but we have Ms. Alexis Bautista, who will speak on his behalf. Alexis Bautista is a program officer of Migrant Forum in Asia, a regional network focusing on international labor, migration issues, and advocating for the rights of migrant workers and members of their families. Alexis is also the focal point of Migrant Women Forum, a network from the Pacific Asia and MENA looking at women, gender, and migration. We welcome you, Alexis. So Dr. Susan, we also have uh, Dr. Susan Neibon joining us today. She is a professorial fellow and senior associate, Asian Law Center, and research affiliate of the Macmillan Statelessness Center, Melbourne Law School, University of Melbourne. She supervises PhD students on refugee law, statelessness and forced migration in Southeast and East Asia and has written widely law, governance and forced migration on those issues. She's currently working on two Australia Research Council funded projects towards development of the legal framework for regulation of international marriage migration and Indonesia's refugee policies, responsibility, security, and regionalism. We welcome you, Dr. Susan. Thank we you also, very much. We also have with us Dr. Julia O'Connell Davidson. She is a professor in social research at the University of Bristol. In 2001, she was commissioned by the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to conduct a multi-country pilot research on the demand side of trafficking. Her other research areas include prostitution, sex tourism, child prostitution, human rights, transnational crime, etc. These themes are further developed in her book, Modern Slavery, The Margins of Freedom, Paul Grief Macmillan, 2015. We welcome you, Dr. Julia. We, we also have with us Dr. Jill Hanley. She's a professor at the Meckel School of Social Work and scientific director of the Sherpa Research 
Institute on Migration, Health, and Social Services. Her work focuses on closing the gaps between policies and practice concerning the social rights of migrant populations. She's also the co-founder of Montreal's Immigrant Workers Center, where she has been actively involved since 2000. And this is to inform all of you that Sanjana Banerjee uh, is not keeping well and would not be able to conduct the session today. I will take the session ahead for today. I'm Dyashini Roy. I have recently completed my master's in English and Comparative Literature from Pondicherry University, India. I am published in several national and international journals of repute. I am also a senior project assistant at Tell Me a Story. So without further ado, I would now like to invite Professor Nibon to share her insights on the topic. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much indeed, and well done for this venture. So my interest in trafficking began quite some time ago when the Australian government threw a lot of money into the topic. And at that stage, they were only interested in the question of prostitution, women, and I did a lot of research in Southeast Asia and discovered that, in fact, the issue was not so much about prostitution. It was really largely about young people who were being tricked or coerced in some way into moving into other countries and they were then exploited. So the very strange thing about labour uh, trafficking is that it's not a term that appears in the trafficking protocol, which the international community formulated in the early part of the 20th century. In fact, the only reference to labour that appears in that uh, protocol is the idea of forced labour. And it's an irony of the whole situation that it's it's in fact the largest part of the problem, the problem of so-called labour trafficking is a term that has come into use but is not in fact a, a sort of a, a technical term as such to refer to the large body of, of people who move irregularly and often, as I say, from circumstances where they're vulnerable or they're made vulnerable by the way that they're treated as, as this destination. And we do have, as I will explain in my question and answer session, a very incomplete legal regime other, other than human rights, which are not always uh, respected or applied by countries around the world. We, in fact, do not have a, a, a regime to deal with the problem of labour trafficking as such, except in so far as it falls within the meaning of trafficking in the trafficking protocol. So I think that this is one of the ironies of the situation that it is indeed one of the very largest problems in the uh, whole uh, world and particularly in Southeast Asia, as I say, there were many, many instances of young people in particular who, for various reasons, wanted to move to another country and found that they were exploited at destination, but often the exploitation began right at the beginning in their home villages particularly. Recruiters to the, in the villages were themselves working for another chain of people and they would be passed along. And so my experience in that context was that there was a huge gap between the policy makers and what was happening on the ground. Policy makers were still very keen to see the problem as one to do with, 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 with sexual exploitation, whereas in fact the, the main problem was, was labour trafficking. And it's only gradually that this problem has, has been accepted uh, and, and 
been rebadged again as 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 modern modern slavery, and so it's really as a story I would say of a, a huge gap between policymakers and reality, and the lack of a coherent legal framework. So I think I'll end my comments there, and I can probably say more during the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susan. Um, that was uh, informative. And thank you for uh, acquainting us with the voids and trafficking um, that is still there in Southeast Asia. Uh, OK, so moving on, I would uh, now like to hand it over to Professor Davidson to present her perspectives on the topic. Over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, I always find it a bit difficult to be brief or know how to focus, but I suppose that my entry point is that I have always wondered why we're talking about trafficking and modern slavery rather than talking about capitalism. Um, and one of the problems that I find with the debates on trafficking is a tendency to think in terms of binaries, conceptual binaries. So everything is either or, it's either slavery or freedom, it's either forced or voluntary movement, it's either illegal or illegal movement, it's either trafficking or smuggling. And these binary concepts are actually a, a very poor fit with reality um, and because they're a poor fit with reality they tend to lead to interventions um, that I would argue are unhelpful. So just to quickly flesh that out in relation to debt for instance, in dominant discourse on trafficking debt is often presented as one of the key mechanisms by which migrants, um, women in particular, are reduced to a condition of slavery. But um, the immediate and very tricky problem with talk of debt slavery in the context of migration um, is that uh, indebtedness is ubiquitous amongst migrants. It costs money to move, uh, especially in the context of uh, more restrictive immigration regimes. And there's a great deal of research to show that whether people move through legally sanctioned or irregular channels, the fees charged by people who facilitate migration are very high and people frequently borrow or indebt themselves to migrate. So indebtedness is the norm, not the exception amongst migrants. But I think it's also important to remember that indebtedness is the norm amongst everybody. We're all debtors. Um, so what kind of indebtedness and what type and level of restraint, restraint on freedom tips the balance between being just an ordinary debtor, a migrant debtor, uh, and being a, a so-called victim of trafficking or a modern slave. And basically the uh, anti-trafficking and anti-slavery literature um, campaigners tend to implicitly subdivide debt into two distinct types. So people think that there's a good type of debt which is organized as a commodity exchange by banks, by building societies, student loan companies and so on. And that belongs, it's imagined, to the realm of impersonal, contractual market relations. Uh, it's the kind of debt that people like me, um, Global North, privileged, white, we take that debt on. And then it's imagined that there's also a bad type of debt that uh, drags victims into uh, inescapable and profoundly asymmetrical personal relationships of power in which they're deprived of freedom of movement and control over their bodies. Um, and the, the trouble again is, is that this too has a very poor fit with actual evidence on international migrants um, who are very rarely actually permanently locked into a slavery-like relationship with one creditor or trafficker. 
It's usually these are much more time limited arrangements. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the, the idea of a good bad debt doesn't actually map onto a voluntary involuntary binary because debt that entails a very high level of dependency on a creditor and that can lead to very heavy restraints on freedom can actually be actively chosen. Um, and there's a lot of research, for instance, on Nigerian women and girls in sex work in Italy um, uh, that has repeatedly found that even though they, they're dependent, debt dependent on um, a madam who organizes their work, they view the madam as a potential benefactor rather than as a criminal, as a hero rather than a villain, as somebody who's helped them to realize their migration projects. And, you know, obviously that doesn't mean that, uh, that, that they aren't subject to appalling working conditions or even to violence, but it does mean that the, the, false, the forced voluntary distinction doesn't map out well. And that's the same in relation to legal migration as well. If you think about, for instance, uh, the migrant workers who have moved perfectly legally to work in Qatar, on the building sites preparing for the World Cup. Um, and there have been 6,500 deaths, uh, at, at least amongst those workers in the last 10 years. But um, even though those deaths and the appalling conditions are well publicized, um, in Nepal, for instance, the, the Department of Foreign Employment has continued to, to throng with crowds queuing up for permission to migrate. Um, and, you know, at one point, even after these deaths had been publicized, they were still processing 1,200 to 1,500 applications a day. Um, and so, you know, you're left with, if you if you work with these binaries, binary thinking where everything's either or, you, you're left with this seeming contradiction of, you know, uh, that there could be voluntary um, victims of trafficking or willing slaves. And um, I think when you try and unpack that, it comes back to this problem that happens because there's a tendency also amongst the people who are making policies to divide the world into people like me and people like them. And, uh, you know, um, actually people like me also enter into contracts that imply restrictions on our freedom. You know, um, most employment contracts bind you to working a three month period um, of, of notice before you leave. And yet we don't regard ourselves as slaves and deprived of the freedom to move from a workplace. And also people like me can take on risks to try and realize our aspirations. I can take on debts. Uh, I can hostage the future against the present. Uh, and so I'm still gambling when I take out a massive mortgage that I'm not going to be able to um, get out of without that implying quite serious restrictions and problems for me. But it's not considered um, to be risky in the same way as the people who are on the move, who are from the global south or who are from poorer communities. Um, and uh, I suppose that the other thing to, to recognize about that is that there are um, the, the division between impersonal markets in credit and debt uh, doesn't actually map um, precisely onto those who are victimized and those who are not. Because if, if we're trying to think about the sort of social relations that drive people to act against their own will or put themselves in risky situations, then we shouldn't be only focusing on monetized debt. Um, there was actually an interesting uh, report about one of the Nepalese construction workers who died in Qatar, uh, a 23-year-old um, named Mokhtan. And he came from a poor village and his elderly father had borrowed the equivalent of around a thousand pounds to pay for his passage and agency fees to Qatar. 
hoping that uh, Moktan was going to be able to assist the family by remitting some of his earnings home. And the money was borrowed from a loan shark uh, that was supposed to be uh, reimbursed by Moktan's Qatari employee, but that didn't happen. But the contract was between um, between the loan shark and Moktan's elderly father, not with Moktan himself. So the loan shark wasn't actually exercising direct personalistic power over Moktan while he was working in Qatar. But it nonetheless seems very probable that his father's monetary debt would have weighed very heavily on Moktan, so that even if he hadn't been bound in other ways by the constraints of, of the kafala system, he wouldn't really have felt free to walk away from the hazardous, possibly also violent working conditions that he faced. So the trouble is that debt exists on both sides of what's imagined as a public-private division. In the public realm of the market, debt's framed as the impersonal object or thing um, that can be precisely quantified and uh, transferred, commodified, traded. But in the uh, private realm, debt's imagined as a, as a human and moral phenomena. Um, yet, actually, all of us are debtors in, in, in both senses all of the time. All of us are constrained by obligations. And sorry, I know I'm going on too long. So I will just uh, stop by saying that, um, you know, if we fail to recognize those ambiguities and the complexities and the, the fuzzy line between these things, then we stop understanding that um, in a context, in a world where markets play a central role in the production and distribution of material sustenance, then access to markets becomes a source of freedom as well as a source of unfreedom. So if you live in a society where there is no functioning system of welfare to protect people from the market, then adults and teenagers who, for various reasons, can't access labor markets or credit markets, then they often find that, um, to paraphrase Joan Robinson, the misery of being exploited by an employer or a creditor or exploiting oneself in informal economies is nothing compared to the misery of not being exploited at all. Stop there. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, David Sun. That was uh, really informative and a wonderful take on the topic of today's discussion. Thank you for, uh, you know, uh, giving us insights into the conceptual binaries and i'll come back to you when we talk about state-sponsored uh, trafficking as of now i move on to alexis and i would kindly request you to take the session ahead by sharing your insights on the topic alexis thank you so much um, if you would allow me, um, on behalf of William Goyce, I would talk about how migrant form in Asia has been engaging the trafficking in the past years, if not decades, and hopefully from there you could understand the discourse, or the changing discourse rather, of the nexus between labor migration and labor trafficking. Um, I feel to let you mention that I'm also taking up a master's degree on women and development at the University of the Philippines. So with that, I will attempt to give a gender dimension on this topic as well. Um, as MFA, we have kept trafficking at arm's length. Um, we have seen how easily this discourse can slip into state security issues and border control issues. But in terms of working with the framework, we recognize that trafficking and migration have similar pathways and routes that are the same and there is an overlap in situations of labor. And we do see trafficking within the context of forced labor. Um, as I work in the Secretariat, we have been calling, trying to call out of being careful of the framework because it can lead, again, uh, the discourse can lead into securitization of uh, member states or of governments. 
And as a network, we need to have a lot of learning in these frameworks, the nexus between labor trafficking um, or trafficking in general, as well as um, migration. Um, we worked a bit with the Bali process, which looks at um, trafficking um, in uh, Asian countries, as well as Australia, uh, with Indonesia and Australia being the chair. Um, we very much look into why this is happening, um, the root causes or what has led to this situation on why do people succumb to um, labor migration or why do they succumb to um, trafficking for that matter. And we're trying to understand the vulnerabilities and getting our network to uh, look at rather than a framework of merely crossing borders, um, uh, member states rather, to look at the framework of merely crossing borders. Um, in the past years, we have collaborated with different trafficking networks to some extent, uh, which exist within the region, at least in Asia. Uh, and we want to look at or go beyond the sex work framework and look into the labor trafficking framework as well. And we also try to see labor migration in the context of climate change, trade, debt, as was mentioned earlier on, um, debt and development, women and so GSC movement, and trafficking, um, for that matter. Um, we try making these connections to understand migrate, migratory movements and understand the root causes again and the drivers of migration that lead to situations where migrants find themselves in vulnerable situations that lead them to trafficking. We look at how countries of origin, countries of destination um, can collaborate, and these include actors, not just civil society, academia, but also trade unions and governments and um, private sector as well. And we try to collaborate on looking at policies on how we can move forward, um, keeping in mind and um, ensuring that it, it is used with a human rights um, based framework. Uh, moving forward, we need to be more vigilant because of the trafficking networks that might come alive. Um, as we, as MFA, we are engaged in the Gulf region as well, um, and there has been um, uh, health certificates have been forged um, due to this pandemic of them trying to overcome those ever-changing restrictions um, because of the COVID pandemic. And we're trying to understand and see the impact of those who have um, been repatriated, those who have been stuck in countries of destination, or those who have come back in countries of origin, but wherein sub-agents um, let them go through the informal or the irregular channels for them to go back to uh, another country of destination um, in search for work, which in this sense, comes into the framework of labor trafficking again, or um, the at least the labor context of trafficking. Um, over this pandemic, uh, we saw the deployment of care work and essential workers or frontliners because of the demand of the pandemic, and um, especially for domestic workers, migrant domestic workers, um, we see that they have been overworked, they have been exploited in different ways. The context is changing and evolving, but then the demand is still there. I think that would I'd like to finally emphasize that um, I think it's important that trafficking or labor, modern slavery exists because the demand exists. The demand of labor, the demand of cheap labor, the demand of sex work from employers, perpetrators, and accomplices continues to be there. And I think it's a matter of us trying to be um, be more vigilant about this and to continue the work that we do, um, looking at the human rights-based framework. And as um, part of the civil society and as a network, we try to engage more um, through these platforms or uh, these opportunities to look at the nexus of labor migration and labor trafficking. Uh, with that, uh, I'll end this here and then I'll probably share more in the Q&A if there's ever any question that comes up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexis, for that um, perceptive talk. And it's really important to focus on uh, the imperative need of our collective conscious endeavor uh, 
to strategize on policy influencing and advocacy for justice to stop perpetrators from uh, exploiting the vulnerabilities of uh, these underprivileged populations. Uh, moving on, uh, Professor Kamale, we look forward to hearing our perspectives on the topic of today's discussion. Thank you very much. I'm going to be sharing uh, some of our experience in Canada with labor trafficking. And um, I want to make the argument basically that we have immigration policies in Canada that make labor trafficking basically what I would argue a crime of opportunity, that it's the government policies that put migrants into a position where they are unable to defend their rights easily. And it sort of gives the opportunity to employers to engage in coercion and exploitation. So some key points about what uh, form labor trafficking takes in Canada. I, I've worked with some colleagues to review the legal cases against um, labor, um, forced labor and labor trafficking in Canada. And all the documented cases we were able to find involved people born outside of Canada and usually people who had precarious immigration status. So that meant people who um, are coming to Canada on a temporary basis with a status that depends on a third party. And many of them were actually coming on Canada's temporary foreign worker program, which is meant to be a legal and safe uh, channel for people to come for cyclical migration to Canada. Um, also, the labor trafficking that's been documented in Canada very rarely involves organized crime, like almost never. And what we see instead is that uh, most often these are people who are hired under legal um, procedures in legal sectors of employment. But over time, the employer realizes that uh, they have the opportunity to exploit them and that the program itself offers coercion to keep them in the, the, the bad employment. Um, so what we see is that it's, it really does not fit the picture of human trafficking that exists in the Canadian mind, I think probably internationally, where um, the typical victim of this is female, young, uh, and in uh, the sex trade. Uh, instead, what we see most, the majority of these cases, it's actually men, uh, not necessarily young, and in all types of labor. And this makes it very difficult to pursue criminal charges. Just to give you an idea of the types of sectors, we see um, people in retail and hospitality services, domestic work is a big one. Agriculture is the largest sector that we've had uh, uh, documented cases of human trafficking in, but also skilled and technical work like welders and electricians and general manual labor. So all of you know, the sectors are very wide and um, Canada's immigration policies make it so that if someone is in a, a, a employment that is exploitative, um, they cannot easily change employers. If they leave the job, they may uh, lose their right to be in Canada. And this relates back to the question of debt that was raised before. Um, the consequences for um, these workers, if they lose their employment, they often lose their status, then they lose their source of income. And unlike Canadians who might take the risk to lose their uh, employment, they have no safety net. There's no uh, social welfare available to them to replace that income. So um, not only is the, are they themselves and their family uh, at, you know, risking losing their source of, of well-being uh, if they have um, bigger debts, then it can mean loss of all the family's assets and um, in many cases, actual uh, violent reprisal. Um, I want to give some examples from Quebec where I live of examples of this. So um, one big case we had at the Immigrant Workers Center was a group of Guatemalans who came to Canada to uh, on the temporary foreign worker program 
to work as chicken catchers. And if you've not thought about how they get chickens from a barn into the store, it's, uh, it's a very tough job, very physical, very dangerous, um, with a lot of infection and injuries from this job. So these workers were in a job where the employer has had repeated complaints against it for labor violations and for health and safety violations. So really like a terrible job. And they were approached by a third party who said, hey, come and work for me. I'll do all the paperwork you need to do to change your immigration visas and you'll have better conditions with me. So they, they left that first employer. They signed a bunch of papers with the new one they paid, you know, a couple thousand dollars each on top of the fees they'd already paid to come to Canada in the first place. They paid the new employer the fees to change their immigration papers and started to work. Um, conditions were just as bad. Finally, they were not being paid properly. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, one day they were arrested by immigration. And then when they discovered that these papers that they signed and the fees mm -hmm. that they paid for the immigration were never actually submitted to the government. So in fact, they had become undocumented workers. So they were arrested, detained. A number of them were immediately deported. The rest of them have spent years fighting for uh, status and trying to show that it was the employer that was exploiting them. The employer though was never charged with trafficking because um, human trafficking laws, and I think maybe um, our first colleague will have uh, seen this, it often is looking for some very stereotyped examples of fear that the workers have to have been in fear that they had no, they were completely tricked, that they had no idea um, what was going on. Whereas in these cases, they willingly went to work for this employer doing that type of work. So these guys have been separated from their families for years and uh, had huge financial losses because of this. Um, another case is domestic workers. Here, a case we had was a woman who came to Canada, an Ethiopian worker who accompanied mm -hmm. her employers from the Middle East to come to Canada. She came again on a legal work program. She was here on the live-in caregiver program. But when she got to Canada, she was locked in the house. She was not allowed to leave. She was not paid. The employer said that he was keeping her salary to like give her at the end so her family would have a good chunk of money at the end and she was um ex you know really treated to psychological abuse and complete social uh, isolation one day she managed to get out of the house she's walking around a suburban neighborhood and uh, eventually talked to some neighbors who were who helped her and called the police but even in this case um trafficking charges were not successful and again no sign of organized crime in all this is just employers who realized that their worker was in a situation that they were able to exploit. A final example that I'll give is a restaurant worker. This was an Indonesian worker who was working on an international cruise ship. And there were a Montreal couple that took their vacation on this trip, uh, on this cruise ship and um, uh, convinced the Indonesian worker that he should come to Montreal to work in their restaurant and they explained the best way to get their work visa was to get an international student visa. So they were also connected to a kind of fake um, English language institution and uh, helped a series of people get international student visas to come and study English at this fake institution when in fact they were uh, working incredible hours in the restaurant without being paid properly this worker uh, slept in the restaurant kitchen, Was uh, had his movement curtailed by the, the employer. Um, but the program that he came on, the international student visa, was legal. And he was afraid to uh, approach anyone for help because he, he was afraid he was going to be charged with fraud and deported. And again, in his case, they, we tried to do human trafficking charges and it was unsuccessful because he didn't seem to fit the, the, the example. Um, of course, there's other forms of labor trafficking in Canada. We have um, the, the, the exploitation coercion by recruiters and placement agencies um, that use mm -hmm. indebtedness, extortion, and fraud to um, keep workers in their uh, positions. 
and um, I do think that the, the stakes for these workers, if they leave, are higher than for Canadians, which is why they're the only ones that are in this uh, situation. There's also, uh, I think you, you could talk about forced labor within families um, in abusive marriages or abusive family di dynamics and often working in family businesses. And there's the exploitation of undocumented workers who they are not here on a legal basis uh, and then can find themselves um, subject to abuse and exploitation by employers who use their um, precarious status to keep them in the situation to coerce them. And finally, there is um, examples of people being trafficked to get involved in criminal activity like uh, drug trafficking. But these are really very rare um, apart from the recruiters. Um, the other three cases are, are comparatively rare um, mm -hmm. compared to the labor migrants because there is um, this government program that holds them in, in there. So I'll finish with that. Um, just to say that it's, it's uh, when we have uh, restrictive immigration policies, it can make trafficking a crime of opportunity. It's just it's too easy for employers to take advantage and leaving workers little recourse. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hanley, for sharing your wonderful insights with us and for bringing to the forefront a comprehensive uh, analysis of the jarring realities of labor trafficking. Uh, well, I will now move on to the question and answer segment. And my first question is to Dr. Susan Neeboon. And this is with reference to the article that you had written titled The Governance of Labor Migration in Southeast Asia. Uh, so, Doctor, would you like to comment on the gaps or lacks in the governance of labor migration? Thank you. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for their interesting comments, too, which fleshed out my very brief comments. I, indeed, I wrote that article 11 years ago, and the theme in that article was really to focus on ASEAN's role, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in Asia, the work and to compare the work of ILO and IOM. But I did bring in a statement by standing on the ILO who talked about how the work of the ILO is embedded in the economy uh, in society. And I think this is one of the issues that we have to face with labour trafficking, that it does arise from a power imbalance and that power imbalance like I just did. <laughs> uh, that power imbalance is both between the individual and the state, which is sending the individual, and the state which receives it, as well as in the situation where the employer is in a position of power too. And what I found was that although IO, ILO and IOM had perfectly good standards, they were non-binding, non-consensual, and my further work following that article shows that in fact it is the states who are largely allowing people to be exploited, particularly in Southeast Asia where we have a situation of states receiving labour migration from countries such as Indonesia, Cambodia, um, India, um, also, um, the Philippines, of course, is, is, is largely dependent on, economy is largely dependent on the remittances of migrants. And there is indeed a complete gap, I would say, in this area. The, there is an international covenant on the protection of rights of migrant workers, and if states would sign up to that, and if they did follow it, it would indeed prevent a lot of this exploitation, but I think Jill is right when she talks about um, uh, the capitalist situation. 
in countries such as Indonesia, people are referred to as labor surplus. They're regarded as commodities. They're regarded by commodities by everyone in the chain. And basically those who are exploited are those who lack information of course, the uh, global, uh, the recent global compact on migration has been entered into, but that doesn't really take the matter very much further. The the answer is is really to make states to stand up to their responsibilities, and that was what my earlier work on migration and the role of ASEAN showed. That the ASEAN Declaration on the Rights of Migrants was was comparing, juxtaposing the rights of sending states, receiving states, and this all relates back to the system of states, the fact that it's their nationals who are leaving. If you look at the definition in the International Covenant on the Protection of the Rights of Migrant Workers, it refers to migrant workers as nationals who are outside their country. There's still an assumption that we, that we have a system whereby states are responsible for their people, but in fact, as, we, as I've been suggesting, many states are, are basically irresponsible both sending and receiving countries and there is a huge governance deficit on this issue which is is is, is supposedly taken up by the trafficking regime which tries to turn this, this very human rights issue into a question of uh, international criminal law so i will stop there thank you Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susan, uh, for sharing your uh, wonderful insights with us. Uh, do you also have uh, any recommendations or suggestions for future gov governance strategies, uh, especially for developing countries like India? Well, the Philippines, in fact, is an example that we can look to. The Philippines does have a lot more regulation on the sending of labour migrants. Unfortunately, once people are outside of a jurisdiction, it's very hard to control the situation or to keep people are safe. And indeed, labour migration in the context of Southeast Asia and the Middle East is often uh, a situation which is extremely dangerous where where even labor attaches from the philippines have been killed so i think it is a question of states recognizing responsibilities it is a question of of everybody pooling together to to ensure that states do in fact respect the rights of individuals but I don't think that we're, we're there yet, and I think it will be a long way before we are. There is no system of forced migration and see labour migration in the sense in which we're talking about it. If we talk in terms of, of binaries, as, as um, Julia mentioned, we are talking about largely uh, unskilled people, people without knowledge, people who are vulnerable, not not our, our highly skilled um who there, there is, is, is very little interest without a lot of edu education on the part of organisations such as UNDP, for example, to try and correct the approaches of states. The, 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 the system must be state-led, otherwise we have a situation such as the as exists with the area of refugee law, which is one of my other areas where, where states are, are, are always holding the UNHCR to account rather than working with it. So up there and let others have a chance to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susan, uh, for those uh, brilliant insights. Uh, moving on, my next question is for Dr. Julia. Uh, in an article, titled Trafficking, a Demand-Led Problem, uh, authored by you and Dr. Bridget Anderson. You had stated that states can play an important role, uh, both through action and inaction, in shaping the demand for the labor services
vulnerable workers. Could you elaborate on this issue? And also, uh, can we extend this to justify the concept of state-sponsored trafficking? Um, so I think I'd want to start by saying that it's really important to remember why human trafficking came to be seen as an urgent uh, global problem and the way that it's been framed as a problem, which basically tracks back to the 1990s when there was growing political anxiety in liberal global north states about what came to be termed transnational organized crime and also crucially about immigration control because in the context of more porous borders post-war, uh, post-Cold War um, era, uh, state actors saw these as threats to national sovereignty and security. So actually interest in trafficking was driven by a concern with crime and with state sovereignty, not with human rights. But at the same time, unauthorized movement of people was subdivided into uh, migrants who were assumed to be complicit with the criminals, smuggled persons, and those who were assumed to be their victims, trafficked persons. So although it came into, trafficking came into international law as a problem of crime control, not human rights, it was also always discussed as though it was a humanitarian issue. And that was incredibly useful for global North state actors because there's a very obvious tension between their obligations under international human rights law on the one hand and their desire to control and restrict human mobility on the other. And you only have to look at the thousands of people currently drowning uh, in the sea and freezing to death in forests at Europe's borders as a result of their viciously um, restrictive immigration regimes to see that tension between human rights and these claims to sovereign control over borders. And the idea of human trafficking as both a crime and an especially egregious violation of human rights was great for Global North governments because they could say, oh, we're, we're just closing down all opportunities to enter the territory in order to protect people from a fate worse than death, the evil of trafficking. So trafficking helped to vi in, make invisible uh, the violence of immigration control and to shift the focus to these so-called criminal gangs who were exploiting and uh, victimizing people. And that also is the, it's why I think, um, because Susan mentioned the Australian government's interest in tra uh, trafficking and modern slavery. And, and you can see in relation to labor exploitation, that works very well as well for them. This is a discourse that uh, conceals all their failures. If you consider the fact that uh, I'm basically, um, you know, it's, uh, trafficking makes it sound as though it's about some different market. Uh, but in capitalist economies, production is organized in pursuit of profit and employers always have an interest in securing labor on the cheapest and most flexible terms. And what normally stops them from just treating workers as completely disposable pieces of human garbage, not even human, and using them and then getting rid of them, what stops them is state um, uh, controls and regulation of employment relations and of workplaces. And that was, of course, uh, is linked to um, protections from the market as well, which is why you had the model of worker citizenship that organized labor work for politically to make sure that people enjoyed um, the kinds of basic rights and protections from the market as well as within employment. And um, I mean, I think just to, to return to if you have that safety net, um, as Jill was saying, for, for people who are Canadian nationals, for instance, if you have the safety net, it means you can walk away. If you don't have that safety net, um, it's much more difficult to quit and remove yourself from a bad situation. So 
national governments, I would say, are implicated in the construction of poor work and vulnerable workers by failing to protect, to provide protections um, against workplace hazards, exploitation, abuse. If you think about domestic work, 90% of domestic workers around the world, um, that's around 47 million people, don't have the same labor basic labor rights as workers in other sectors so states are constructing domestic work as a separate and more uh, highly vulnerable area think about for instance cuts to workplace labor inspections because while global north governments have been bleating on about trafficking and modern slavery and very politely asking businesses if they would mind awfully monitoring their supply chains Actually, at the same time, they've been uh, stepping back from labour law enforcement and recent research found that across the EU, safety inspections have been cut by a fifth since 2010. There are 1,000 fewer labour inspectors uh, available to visit workplaces. Um, in the UK, uh, employers can expect to receive a visit from the minimum wage inspectors once every 500 years. So again, these are things that, that as Jill so um, powerfully put it, make labor abuse into a, a crime of opportunity. Um, and especially the, cre the creation of vulnerability through the construction of workers who are migrants as, as being excluded from uh, the rights and protections that workers who are citizens enjoy. and. Those, those, the visas, the terms of visas are just so uh, shocking in terms of what they exclude workers from that uh, not only only providing temporary um, authorization, but tying them, actually bonding them legally to the mm -hmm. employer who sponsors them. And, you know, that can be coupled with many more appalling infringements of workers' uh, basic rights like... Mm -hmm. uh, with with uh, even saying that that uh, women in migrant women in Malaysia, for instance, have to undergo mandatory pregnancy testing prior to departure and so on. So, you know, all of those ways, I would say that the the state is implicated in constructing the the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for those uh, uh, extremely enriching insights. Moving on, my next question is to uh, Alexa. Sorry, Alexis. Uh, you have been an uh, active proponent of a paradigm shift in the governance of labor migration. Uh, could you elaborate on how this paradigm shift can happen? And also, how can we link this to the aspect of labor trafficking? Thank you, Deyazini. Well, as I mentioned before, um, is that we have been trying to look into the different um, paradigms of climate change and migration, debt and development and migration, labor trafficking and migration. And we we're trying to see how um, people are being driven to these spaces in terms of labor trafficking or labor migration. How they are, what are the reasons that they move? What are the demands or what are the push and pull factors that play in the role of um, the, these dynamics that come into play? And in terms of um, how the shift is there, it's constantly changing. It, it actually goes fa uh, too fast for us to even try to catch up because especially here in this pandemic, we try to see how um, a lot of these perpetrators or these traffickers are going um, under, um, are bypassing the, the restrictions of the different countries of origin and destination, um, bypassing their health protocols um, by way of bringing in um, people from one country to another because the demand is still there in terms of care work again, in terms of domestic work or unpaid um, informal work, um, especially in the essential workers. 
um, at least in the Gulf region that, that we have been engaging with, or at least in, um, in Asia as well, in some of the countries of destination, such as Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, um, and yeah, they're in the Gulf region. And we, have trying, we are trying to see how these things have come into play in terms of how they are um, being restricted um, as migrant workers or as, um, uh, as workers mm -hmm. themselves. They are trying, they are restricted in terms of, for example, in their dorms, they're not able to go out because of the pandemic. They're not able to access any healthcare, access any social services. And we're trying to see these new dynamics that how countries have been, are being, making use of the whole security issue and health issue as well to restrict the movements or the mobility of people. And with that, um, there's that shift in that sense. Um, and uh, with that, I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexis, for sharing your insights with us. Uh, well, my next question uh, is for Dr. Hanley. Uh, you had uh, written an article titled The Intersection of Exploitation and Coercion in the Cases of Canadian Labor Trafficking. Uh, would you shed some light on this intersection of uh, exploitation and coercion? Yes, sure. Uh, one of the reasons why we wrote this article is because we really wanted to clarify that there's a continuum of, of exploitation, but being able to analyze the, uh, the situation well can make the difference between being able to have legal recourse or not. So we wanted to help uh, frontline workers and also people studying this issue to think about where a, a, a labor situation falls on a, a continuum. So we start with the idea of just precarious work. So a precarious job would be physically and emotionally difficult. There's a lack of social recognition. There's often poor pay, difficult hours. There may be bad relations with the colleagues and boss and even health and safety risks. But that kind of job could still be totally legal. And somebody in that situation would not have a lot of legal recourse. Uh, if they wanted to get out of that, they would have to look for a better job. And we know this is happening on the labor market all the time. But just to understand if you're trying to help someone who, who is in a difficult situation, if that's all that's going on, then uh, uh, their best option is to find a new job. There could be exploitation though. So this would be when the third party, usually the employer, is illegally or unfairly profiting from their work. So labor violations, they're not paying minimum wage. They are not paying all their hours. There's health and safety violations. Um, or there could be human rights violations in terms of discrimination, harassment. Um, and even there could be some types of criminal violations like, um, well, violence or, um, uh, a sexual assault of different levels in the workplace. And if someone is experiencing exploitation of this courts, uh, of this type, there is legal recourse. Um, and in Canada, at least, um, migrant workers who are often ultimately the victims of trafficking, they are protected by all the same legal protections as other workers in Canada. They have a lot of barriers to doing something about it because they are tied to their employer and it makes a very difficult situation, but they can. And the last situation is when there's actually coercion. And this is kind of like the, the step that leaves something um, that brings it from just labor exploitation to the level of human trafficking or forced labor. And that's when there's a third party who is controlling their labor mo mobility, but it can either be directly or through threats um, and it can be active or passive. So it could be, they could be actively physically blocking their movement. They could be using violence against them, but they could also just be using threats and even administrative controls uh, that keeps them there. Um, it could be the employer themselves or the employer could be taking advantage of, for example, our immigration policy to do that. Um, so, so when you have the combination of exploitation and coercion, 
uh, that's when we say that there's human trafficking. I, I would argue that in Canada, we have a lot of people working under conditions of coercion because of our temporary foreign worker program. But because the employers follow the labor standards and health and safety standards, they're not having exploitation according to Canadian law. And so then it becomes nearly impossible to say that it's trafficking. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's interesting to think about this if you're trying to help someone who's in a bad work situation, where are they on this continuum? And what does that mean is possible in terms of recourse? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanley. What a a wonderful way to end the session on and uh, I'm sure this would help research uh, aspirants in furthering the future research. Um, I would like to thank each one of you for being with us today and uh, sharing your valuable wisdom for project. This is to state that we are seeking submissions in the form of stories, forms, and essays as part of our project. The registrations are also open for our advanced writing workshop season four. To know more, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. So we are coming up with more academic discussions for our project to be live streamed on our page. Don't forget to stay tuned and bye-bye for today. A humble thanks to all of you for supporting us in our endeavors. Stay tuned, all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.